days the Sunday after the Ascension. The epistle is taken from St. Peter's epistle. Dearly beloved, be prudent and watchful in prayers. Before all things, have a constant mutual charity among yourselves. For charity covers a multitude of sins. Using hospitality one towards another without murmuring. As every man has received grace, ministering the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the words of God. If any minister, let him do it as of the power which God administers, so that in all things God may be honored through Jesus Christ our Lord. Please stand for the Gospel. The Gospel reading is taken from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. At that time Jesus saith to his disciples, when the paraclete comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he shall give testimony of me, and you shall give testimony because you are with me from the beginning. These things I have spoken to you, that you may not be scandalized. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the hour comes that whosoever kills you will think that he does a service to God. And these things will they do to you because they have not known the Father, nor me. But these things I have told you, so that when the hour shall come, you may remember that I told you of these things. This is the Gospel of all. We have some announcements. The Mass this evening is offered for the special intention of Patricia Eaton. The second offering today is for the Catholic Communication Campaign. The office will be closed tomorrow, Monday, in honor of Memorial Day. We all have a duty to write a will and advanced health care directives for the peaceful good of those we will leave behind. Our parish is sponsoring a free estate planning seminar this Saturday at 6 p.m in the parish center. Saturday, June 10th, will be the priestly ordination of deacons Alvin Yu and Michael Lillidal at 10 a.m. in the cathedral. The Star Outreach of the Homeless is asking for wet wipes by Friday, June 16th, to be placed in the blue barrel by the chapel. Join our street evangelization team on Sunday, June 23rd, 25th, I'm sorry, at the Giants baseball game. They will be handing out black and orange rosaries. Also should announce, as you know, this mass started out as a high mass, a sung mass, but the singers seem to have disappeared. And of course, you can't have a high mass if you don't have at least a couple of singers. That's kind of a minimum. So we are in the process of looking for singers, trying to find out how much they will charge for their services at mass. So we hope to return to a high mass as soon as possible. But as I say, it's impossible to have a high mass without at least two singers. In today's Gospel, our Lord speaks about the descent of the Holy Spirit and as a result of the Holy Spirit's descent, the Holy Spirit will dwell in his apostles, the divine indwelling. And one of the consequences of the Holy Spirit indwelling the apostles will be that he will give them the power to give testimony to Jesus Christ and to the Gospel. The Holy Spirit will speak through the Apostles, and the Holy Spirit will, as it were, inspire the Apostles so that they know how best to serve by their preaching the Gospel. I want to talk today, a kind of a continuation of last week, on the divine indwelling 
It's a rather peculiar phrase and one wonders what it means. Well, St. Thomas writes that the divine indwelling is not other than being in the state of sanctifying grace. I told you this last week. The only sense in which God can be said to dwell in someone is insofar as God confers upon them the state or condition of sanctifying grace. Now we've already talked about sanctifying grace. It's a formal, actual perfection which inheres in our soul as a principle of supernatural being and action. Form is a principle of action. Therefore, sanctifying grace as a formal quality has the effect of transforming the soul and raising it from the natural to the supernatural level. And since the soul is raised to the supernatural level in being, it is also made capable of supernatural actions. Adjure sequitur essay, action follows the to be of a thing. Sanctifying grace is a habitual, formal quality that gives us a real relation to Almighty God. It places a real relation between us and God. But this relation is a non-mutual relation. Why do we call it a non-mutual relation? Because the relation is real only on the part of the subject who receives grace. When applied to God, it is a minor logical relation. So a real relation is a relation that actually inheres in a subject and changes that subject in some way. When we speak of a minor logical relation, we mean it is real only according to our way of thinking, but is not actually real in the subject to whom it is assigned. Now, super, sanctifying grace then, is a modality of supernatural presence of God that does not involve a real relation in God to us. Now keep in mind that relation is a modality of being, it's a modification of being, it's an alteration of being, not substantially of course, but accidentally. Relation places a change in the subject. The acquisition of a relation places a new mode of being in the subject, so that to acquire a relation involves the actualiza actualization of a potency. I, before I began Mass, I had the potency of becoming related, related, pardon me, of become, becoming related to all of you. Once I started the celebration of the Mass, that potency was actualized and I, I acquired a real relation to you as the celebrant of the Mass. God is pure act. There is no potency in God. God cannot receive anything because there is nothing God is not. St. Thomas puts it this way. There is nothing God is not, because God is the whole reality of existence. God is esse simpliciter, to be simply and absolutely in its infinite wholeness. There is no potency in God, no capacity to receive, nothing he lacks that he can acquire. Therefore, God cannot have a real relation to creatures in the sense that creatures can have an impact on God or affect God or modify God's being in any way. Remember that God is all that he is from all eternity. We often speak of God's action. God's action is identical with God's existence. God's action 
and God's to be, God's essay, his existence. These are identical, they're different only according to our way of thinking. And God's action and his ising are one and eternal. So God's action then, which is one and eternal from all eternity, takes its effect in us as we come to exist in time and in space. Now since God is immutable and beyond every shadow of alteration and change, his action as it comes to effect in his creatures entails no change whatsoever in God. God simply is and is all that he is from all eternity. And this is true of the divine indwelling. Every time we speak of God acting upon us, we're using that particular context. Sanctifying grace, then, is the formal supernatural quality that is a temporal effect in us of God's eternal desire to save. It gives us a supernatural relationship to God that sanctifies us, that justifies us, that makes us holy and righteous in God's sight. And when we are in this state, we are said to enjoy the divine indwelling. And the state, of course, is the state of sanctifying grace. There's another point, I think, that needs to be made. Our sanctification is attributed to the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Blessed Trinity. But in fact, as is the case with all properly divine actions, it is the effect of the one eternal action and decree of the entire Trinity. In other words, you have three distinct persons, three distinct subsistences, communicating among themselves one identical act of existing. And since action follows existence, whatever actions are proper to God are actions that flow from the Blessed Trinity in common. So we should really refer not so much to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as to the indwelling of the Most Blessed Trinity. As St. Augustine said, if the Holy Spirit comes, so also the Father and the Son. Having said this about sanctifying grace, the next question is, how does God's grace reach us? Sanctifying grace is from God. God is the efficient and formal cause of sanctifying grace as it comes to be in us. When we say God is the efficient cause, we mean he is the agent and it is by the force of his power that we are sanctified. When we say that God is the formal cause, we mean that sanctifying grace in some way conforms us to God, makes us like God. Now God is invisible. And God's eternal action, identical with his being, is also invisible. So the question arises, is there any visible, sensible way in which God's invisible action can reach us? Yes. So we'll trace the origin then of sanctifying grace. It comes first of all from God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through the conjoined instrumentality of the sacred humanity of Jesus Christ. It comes to us through the hands of the most blessed and ever Virgin Mary, who is the mediatrix of all graces, as many popes have proclaimed, especially Leo XIII and Pius XII of glorious memory. And it comes to us also through the visible institution of the Roman Catholic Church. Christ instituted a church, and that church is there for the salvation of souls, solus animarum. 
He established that church as the channel through which sanctifying grace would reach those willing to accept it and well disposed to it. That's what we mean really by saying outside the church there's no salvation, extra ecclesia non solus. It doesn't mean that you have to be a formal member of the Roman Catholic Church in order to be saved. The church has never said anything like that. Well, I thought their feeling did, but you know what happened to him? He was excommunicated on that account. But it does mean this, that apart from the church, without the church, there is no salvation because salvation comes to us through the ministry, through the ministry of the church Christ instituted. And the only church which possesses all the essential and fundamental marks of the church instituted by Jesus Christ is the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, not that long ago, the Vatican issued a statement to the effect that Protestant churches could not even be called properly churches. Why? Because they lacked elements that are essential to the definition of the church instituted by Jesus Christ. Now, it may not be particularly politically correct to say these kinds of things, but these things are true. These are teachings that the church has always proposed on every level of its authority. Now, I have said that from God, through the conjoined instrumentality of the human nature of Jesus, through the hands of the most blessed and ever Virgin Mary, the mediatrix of all graces, and through the visible institution of the Roman Catholic Church. God's eternal decree to give grace takes effect in us by virtue of seven ecclesial actions that the Church performs. And these ecclesial actions are called the seven sacraments. And the seven sacraments are the channels instituted by Jesus Christ, and the word instituted means again that it is his power that works through the sacraments. And the sacraments also, of course, are visible, material, empirically verifiable signs. And they are the normal, though not the exclusive channels of grace. So we should look very briefly at the theology of the sacraments, very briefly. First, there are four phrases that pretty much summarize the theology of the sacraments. Remember, we're looking at the sacraments because they are the, the visible means through which Christ, God, communicates sanctifying grace to us. One phrase is ex opere operato, which I'm sure you all remember from your catechism days. Ex opere operato means by the work having been worked. If the sacramental sign is properly put together and constructed by one authorized to do it, then it will invariably work. The effect of giving grace will take place. Why? Because the principal efficient cause, the principal agent in the giving of grace is God himself. The priest or the minister or the bishop, or in the case of baptism, the lay person, is the instrumental subordinate efficient cause. Martin Luther didn't understand that. Nobody is saying the priest has the power to forgive sins on his own. But the priest is a cause of the forgiveness of sins insofar as his action is joined by Christ to Christ's action. And so it is the action of God that produces the effect through the instrumental agency of the priest. And this applies to all the sacraments. Significando causa. The sacraments caused by signifying. As soon as the essential elements of this visible action are properly constructed and put together so that they are present and operative, they constitute a perfect sign 
and in the very context of signifying, they actually cause that which they signify. By way of example, the pouring of water in the sacrament of baptism is certainly a sign of the washing away of original sin and the infusion of sanctifying grace. When the sign is perfectly constructed with matter, form, and intention intact, the signifying of giving grace by this material means, the pouring of water and the saying of words, the signifying of that actually causes the effect it signifies. Bread and wine signify the presence of Christ, but bread and wine go beyond that. They are the very presence of Jesus Christ. It's not bread and wine anymore. It is Jesus Christ himself under the appearances of bread and wine. Another phrase is ex opere operantis. That means from the standpoint of the recipient. Every sacrament has a set of prerequisites that the recipient must bring to the sacrament. But the one prerequisite that is present in all the sacraments is faith. One must believe in the sacrament and want to receive it. Now in the case of infant baptism, the faith of the parents, together with the faith of the church community, suffices. And the final phrase that summarizes sacramental theology is exponentibus or non ponentibus obicem. That means that the sacrament will infallibly work if the sign is properly constructed so long as no obstacle is placed. God gives grace, but we can set up a barrier, a wall, against that grace. So the sacraments work non ponentibus obicem so long as no obstacle is placed. And an obstacle would be the re not wanting the sacraments, being coerced to receive the sacraments, not believing in the sacraments, being in the state of mortal sin when you receive the Holy Eucharist. All these would be obstacles that would block God's action. So to summarize what I've been saying, our Lord has been talking about the divine indwelling. The divine indwelling is being in the state of sanctifying grace. The whole Trinity acts upon us in a way that makes us holy and just, righteous and sanctified in the presence of God. God himself is not changed in any way, shape or form by the action, as it were, of giving grace. God is eternal. Everything he is, everything he does, is from all eternity without any change. So when we speak of God acting upon us and think of God as changing by that, we are simply using a way of speaking that accommodates our way of thinking but doesn't correspond to the actual reality. And my final point, of course, is that God uses visible instruments because we are not angels, we're material beings. So we have the visible agency of the church and the visible agency of the church as expressed in these seven actions instituted by Jesus Christ to give grace. So from God, through Mary, through the agency of the church, through the specific action of the seven sacraments, we are sanctified and made holy.